Um, so I'm just because I just started recording, I'm going to go through that whole spiel real quick again, make sure anybody who's watching the recording get, gets it. Um, the gas laws assignment, the homework and lab will not be due on Sunday like normal. They'll be due uh, next Wednesday so that we have a chance to cover that material in lecture on Wednesday, this coming Wednesday. And then the assignments will be due the following Wednesday, which will be our last official lecture meeting time as well. Um, and then the homework assignment that we would normally be doing next week is the practice test, which will be due during finals week. So you'll still have a whole week and change to work on that as well. All right, so thank you, Gina, for bringing that up because the end of the quarter, all the deadlines start piling up on top of each other. I know how that goes. Um, so we'll try and keep it reasonable um, for you. Nice thing is, as you start crossing stuff up on, um, in the next week, as you start crossing stuff off your to-do list, um, nothing's going to start popping up behind it other than the test and one last homework assignment next week for your practice test. So you guys are almost there. Um, any other questions scheduling-wise? All right. Um, let's do some questions as somebody... So somebody asked about, are we going to have any final exam reviews in lecture as practice? Assuming I can get through all the material that I need to, um, next Wednesday will be all review. It, realistically, based on the stuff where, that I'm still trying to cover, it might be half of it might be some new material still final, finishing up some, some concepts. Um, but the other half of it, at least half of next Wednesday's lecture will be review. Um, and by review, I just mean that you will have opportunity. You guys are going to be in the driver's seat, ask questions, tell me, hey, can we do more practice with precipitation reactions? Or, hey, can we do more pH problems? Um, and we'll just work through problems. And we'll do that. I believe that that's what's on our schedule for um, lab next week as well, I believe, is, is exam review, although I'll double check that. Um, so, yes, yeah, so we'll have lots of time to review because I know we dumped a bunch of new concepts that are kind of tricky on you in the last couple of weeks. And you might have been feeling like you were keeping up just fine until we started doing precipitation and acid base reactions. So we'll keep getting practice with that um, and you guys will be fine. And then we'll also review some of the stuff that you may not have thought about in a month, like um, Vesper geometries and polar molecules that do show up on the final as well. So we'll, we'll do some of those reviews. We'll probably spend most of the review time. Um, we'll be on you know, just going through all the stuff that led up to this last couple of weeks because last we're going to keep practicing this stuff right now so you guys hopefully by next wednesday you'll feel pretty confident or at least like you've got a handle on what's happening when it comes to ph and precipitation reactions um which also leads into the next question if we had another month of class what would we be covering well all the stuff that i wish we were covering right now um but uh we would be getting into gas laws in more detail so how you can predict things like pressure and volume of gases and how they behave. Um, and really, actually probably the number one topic that we don't get a chance to cover in this class that might show up for some of you that go into the healthcare field is nuclear chemistry. Um, how nuclear reactions work, what does it mean that to have a nuclear reaction? What is nuclear medicine? How do we use nuclear isotopes in medicine for things like isotope tracing? Um, I wish we could spend more time covering that. Unfortunately, 12 weeks is just not enough time and that is the least applicable thing when it comes to prepping you for the rest of the classes you're going to have to take. Eventually, you will have that stuff. It just might be in a, in a biology class rather than a chemistry class, um, just because most of you will take more biology than chemistry. Mm -hmm. um, and then along those lines, actually, uh, I got a couple emails about registering for GenChem or OChem for next year. So I wanted to talk to uh, everyone about which chem series you should be taking. If you're looking to go more of the nursing field and you need one more quarter of chemistry, then you probably want to be taking the, the first quarter of organic chemistry series, um, which means there, there is a prereq appeal. There's a form we have to fill out because technically chem one, um, 103 is the prereq, not chem 100 but you do actually have all the tools you need to pass intro or the first quarter of organic chemistry after this class. So if you're looking to go into nursing um, or any of those allied health fields and you need to take 
some more chemistry, you probably want to be taking the organic chemistry one, um, which is a 200 level class. And like I said, it, there is a prereq appeal that will, will um, that I will fill out with you. So let me know if you're in that boat and we'll get you registered. Um, if you are going into any sort of other science related fields, if you're a biology major, if you're pre-med, um, if you're an engineering major, um, if you're a physics major, even I think you're supposed to take um, the Gen Chem series. And so I, and if you're a pre-med or biology major, you'll probably take the whole OCHEM series as well, but you'll just take all of Gen Chem first. Do a year of Gen Chem um, that's going to be a lot more like this class, and then you do a whole year of OCHEM after that. But if you're going into the nursing or allied health fields, you don't need two full years of chemistry on top of this class. So you won't, you would go straight into the intro or the first OCHEM class. Or actually, we also are going to be offering intro to um, biochemistry next winter, which we haven't offered that one in a few years. Um, and I want to get that out there. Anybody who needs one more quarter of chemistry, um, that would be a great class to take because the enrollment's usually pretty low and it's more tailored to um, biochemistry, biology, um, how proteins work, that kind of thing. Um, so definitely um, talk to me or talk to a counselor um, about which chemistry you need to be in. Don't just assume that you need to, which, which class you need to be in because you don't want to be um, set up in the wrong in the wrong series next fall and then have to spend their whole first week dealing with registration issues and switching over and that kind of thing. So if you have any questions about it, let me know. Um, as far as which one I prefer, I really like OCHEM, but that's um, I also really like teaching GenCHEM. GenCHEM is basically a class on how to use algebra in, in science. Um, and it's basically a lot of the stuff we've covered here just in more detail. Um, and slower, frankly, because we have a whole year for it. But organic chemistry is also really, really cool because we get to get into things like neurotransmitters um, and how we actually design and and um, create some of these chemicals in a lab. We act, one of the first labs that we do is actually making aspirin um, from salicylic acid, which is something you can get from willow bark um, and vinegar. Essentially, if you can take if you take really, really strong vinegar called acetic acid and um, and salicylic acid, which again is something you can get from willow bark, um, you can make aspirin. And that's one of the first labs we do, which is really kind of cool that we actually wind up making a product that is some, a pharmaceutical you buy on the, from a grocery store. So um, I like both of them clearly, but that's because I'm into chemistry. So I get that not, not uh, everybody will be quite as excited about them as me, but they're both fun series for different reasons. All right, so let's talk about precipitation reactions because I got a lot of questions about solubility rules, how precipitation reactions work. So let's talk about them a little bit. Um, so these first two are both about no reaction and why we consider it to be no reaction. Um, and one of the the reason that we call it no reaction is if we write out the total ionic equation for some of these, these um, mixtures that where nothing happens. So for instance, if we took sodium chloride and potassium, potassium bromide, if we say NaCl aqueous, and then we're going to mix it with sodium with, uh, sorry, potassium bromide. But when we mix these, what we're really doing, we really have all the separate ions floating around. So before we even look at the, what the products are, let's look at what this looks like when we blow it up and write it as the total ionic equation. We really have sodium ions floating around. and fluoride ions floating around. And then we're gonna have uh, potassium ions and bromide ions. 
if we wind up, if these are the ions that we have floating around when we mix them, when we mix them together, unless we happen to make a combination that's insoluble, if unless we make a combination that won't stay dissolved, that are too strongly attached to each other for water to pull them apart, then when we mix them, after we mix them, we still have all of these same pieces floating around. So we could write them differently if we wanted to write if we wanted to mix up what we had written here um, and put the other cation, mix up the cations and the anions so that we had um, sodium bromide, aqueous, and potassium chloride, aqueous. And we could write it that way, but they're all still aqueous. If they're all still aqueous, then they're not really stuck together as molecules. Really, what we have is the same ions that we wrote in our um, in our complete ionic total ionic equation. Our total ionic form that has them all separated out. That's still what we have when we mix them together. If unless we make something that sticks together as a solid. So that's why we call it no reaction. And no react. So no reaction is a little bit misleading in that if we took it and we evaporated out all the water, we would still get all of those same ions would be there and they would be all mixed together. And we really would have a big mess of stuff. We would have some sodium chloride and some sodium bromide and some potassium bromide and some potassium chloride crystals all sort of mixed together um, based on just the fact that as it evaporates, you start forming these crystals. Um, but realistically, when it's still mixed and they're all still aqueous, we call it no reaction because it's the same before we mix them and after we mix them. We still have all the same ions floating around aqueous, right? So it's not really like anything's changing. <clears throat> um, we just have everything mixed together now. So that's what we what we define for these precipitation reactions what we define as um a reaction is if we make a solid if we make a solid if we make if one of the possible combinations of these ions stick together so well that they don't stay dissolved if they're insoluble if one of the combinations is insoluble then we can actually watch right before our eyes we can watch a solid forming and so that's what we consider the chemical reaction because now we've made a combination of these ions that is so strongly bound together that water can't pull it apart. And so that's that's going to be our, our go to sort of definition for these precipitation reactions. And again, that's going to be anytime you look and see if we're mixing two aqueous ionic compounds together, your first thought should be precipitation reaction. I should look to see if I make anything insoluble. Right? And the way we check that is with the uh, actually bring that back. Ah. Um, the way we check that is with these solubility rules. Right, so these solubility rules, let's erase the top pieces here, are basically just a list of things that don't usually dissolve or a list of things that do dissolve. Right, and so they, they're usually presented as, um, that's what I was looking for. Um, they're usually presented as a series of rules trying to drag it over so we can read it. There it is. That's what I was looking for. Um, <clears throat> and all we're really looking for is we look at what, what are the possible combinations of these ions. And if one of those combinations is insoluble, the second you make something that's insoluble, what that's saying is insoluble means it does not dissolve in water. So if one of your combinations is insoluble when we mix these things together, that just means it turns to a solid. 
and therefore we have a reaction that tells us what the solid is. So out of the ones that I have drawn here, um, we just look at all of these categories on these solubility rules and see where everything that we have fits in. So for instance, sodium and potassium ions, those are both in group one. They're in column one on the periodic table. And it says group one and ammonium compounds are in this soluble category. And it, there are no, no exceptions that have to do with potassium or sodium. The only exception to that is lithium phosphate will form a solid. So the, this exception says, so it says group one is always soluble except for lithium phosphate. If you happen to have lithium ions and phosphate ions, it'll make a solid. That's what this exception is saying. Right, so we have potassium and sodium ions, which are group one, and they're not the exception. Group one is all soluble except for lithium phosphate. So that tells us that there's nothing we could make with the sodium ions and the potassium ions that is going to form a solid because they're in the soluble category. Right, and so on the flip side, if we, if we look down and we find something that's um, one of our polyatomic ions, for instance, is in the insoluble category. Um, so for instance, phosphates. Phosphates are insoluble. Pretty much all phosphates are going to be insoluble. When you mix a phosphate with a positive ion, it's going to make a solid, except for group 1A and, um, and ammonium. So if we, had, if we had magnesium chloride mixed with Let's do, let's do another example here. Now, if we do it as, if we say magnesium chloride, so magnesium is a two plus, so and chloride is a minus one, so it's gonna be two chlorides for every one magnesium, aqueous plus, say potassium phosphate well now when i look at these the individual ions i have to deal with are magnesium ions chloride ions potassium ions and phosphate ions so those are the ones i need to go through and find here and so actually Color. Magnesium ions, aqueous. When we look down here, there's not really anything that we can see that has magnesium involved. Magnesium is not explicitly called out on any of these solubility rules. So with that in mind, we just go to the next one. It's like, okay, well, let's see if we can find the other ions on here and see if, if we can have one of these general rules that we're, that's gonna apply to magnesium. So our next one would be chloride. We just, we talked about chloride. Chloride's down here, soluble, except for silver, lead, copper, and mercury. We don't have any of those around. So we know chloride is not going to be doing anything because none of the other pieces that we have are silver, lead, copper, or mercury. The other ions we have was potassium, which again, we talked about a second ago. Group one, soluble for everything except lithium phosphate. So that tells us that potassium is not doing anything. Potassium is not going to be reacting with anything because we don't, it's one of those column ones. It's not going to have anything to react with. The other piece is phosphate. If we're looking at phosphate, so magnesium, we still don't know about, but all the chlorines are going to be soluble 
and potassium is soluble with everything that we have here. So the only other two options are magnesium and phosphate. If magnesium and phosphate make a combination that's insoluble, that would be our solid. And so again, we didn't have anything for magnesium, but phosphates are generally insoluble except for column one and ammonium. Well, magnesium is not in column one, right? So if magnesium is not in column one, that tells us that phosphate should be insoluble when you make an it or a um, ionic compound with magnesium and phosphate it's not going to dissolve in water, it's insoluble. So when we, that tells us that is our product, is going to be these two forming a solid together. So writing our products, we would write it out, we need to get the, the charges to balance out and cancel out, and it's a three and a two, so it's gonna look a little bit complicated. So we need three magnesiums for every two phosphates to make the charges add up to zero. And that's gonna be solid because that particular combination of ions is not in the soluble category. Right? And then, so we would usually, if we're writing the molecular form of the equation, we would also usually write the the other ions that are still floating around, which in this case would just be potassium chloride, aqueous, because at the end, we still, after we mix these together, we still have the potassium and we still have the chloride. They just don't stick together well enough to turn into a solid. So they stay dissolved. All right, so these solubility rules and I will give you a form of this on your on your test in the in the equation section. You'll have a list of solubility rules. <coughs> Excuse me. <Sorry. coughs> solubility rules um, in your equation section. So all you really need to do for these precipitation reactions is check: Do I make a combination that's insoluble? You make a combination that's insoluble. That's your solid product. If every possible combination is, is still soluble, if everything still dissolves in water when you mix them, that's our classic no reaction. We mixed them together, but we didn't make anything that was attracted enough to each other to make it stick. And I know I keep going back to using the, um, the Wikipedia um, solubility rules, because I think they're fairly broad in general, um, and they look very much like all the others. The article that they come from, however, is not written at a level that's that's presented this at this level. It's presented at the at a level that's that's aimed more towards um, students who are finishing up um, their full Gen Chem series. So they're talking about things like equilibrium constants and solubility product and mathematically, how do we calculate these? That's not the level we're approaching it for this class. For this class is just, does it dissolve or not? Okay. Um, we will get into some of those others. And I, I do still like to present the idea that solubility is a spectrum. Everything is at least a little bit soluble. Sometimes it's just such a tiny amount that we can basically say 0% of it dissolves because it really it's 0.000001% of it dissolves. So technically, it's a little bit soluble, but it's not like you would ever actually be able to measure that amount. Um, so when you see things like some of the other figures that I've shown you have said that slightly soluble, that's really what it's talking about. You can get a little bit of it to dissolve, but for now, we're just treating it, it dissolves or it doesn't. All right, chemistry is kind of a running joke um, among science classes because it seems like every time you take another level of chemistry, you get told that everything you learned last year was wrong. Um, and 
I don't want you to think that having taken one quarter of this, we're getting into the full depth of how complicated this is because it's it's very complicated and almost nothing is binary in terms of yes or no. Everything is a spectrum in chemistry. So I just want you to be aware of that, even though we're going to treat it like it's either soluble or not for the sake of, of simplicity for now. Um, but just know that as you keep going, you will likely find that there are other um, more subtle ways of considering these things. All right, last question about the quiz before we we're just going to go through the numerical example here. Why don't we just why don't we only use total ionic equation since it seems to be the most accurate at describing what's actually happening? Um, basically, because it takes up more space and it's more writing and people are lazy. Um, it is the most accurate way to describe what's happening. It is the best way to help you understand what's happening um, and what's happening before and after. But the problem is, is it takes up a lot of room and takes up a lot of time. So um, while you're still getting used to it, it would not be a bad idea to do all of these precipitation reactions as the total ionic equation. Even if you get, if it's for your own personal scratch paper, you can get a little lazy with writing aqueous even. You don't need to write, if you know what you're writing is a bunch of ions dissolved in water, you don't need to write aqueous after every single one. Um, but it can be helpful to split them up into their individual ions when you're looking at them so that those solubility rules make more sense. Um, any other solubility rules questions? Is there's one more that I would bring up, which was somebody asked about um, if you look up some of the compounds that I that I gave you, like for instance, um, sodium carbonate, Na CO3. I don't think that was a reactant, but that was one of the possible products. If you look up sodium carbonate, sodium carbonate, when you look it up, it says it's a solid. But that doesn't mean it doesn't dissolve in water. It just means if you have pure sodium carbonate, it's present as a solid. You can then take that solid and dissolve it in water, just like dissolving salt in water. Salt is a solid, right? When it's sodium chloride, when it's salt crystals, it is a solid. But the second you put it in water, it starts dissolving. So just looking up what, what the potential compounds are, is not necessarily going to give you the answer. You need the solubility rules to see if you made a combination that doesn't dissolve. That's what you're really looking for. All right, and then a fair number of you, depending on where you rounded, um, you may have gotten um, slightly different numbers for question five for the um, calculation question. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so if you got 0.46 or, um, then that was, that was okay. Um, generally speaking, I think there was, there was just a sig fig error with that. So I, I went, I'm going back and putting 2.75 out of three points. If you got 0 0.464 or something like that, or depending on where you rounded. Um, that was close to the right answer <clears throat> within sig figs anyway. Um, so if we wanted to answer this question, the number one thing to do is start by writing out your chemical reaction. Don't even worry about balancing it yet. Just write it out based on what the names of the compounds are and what it says the products are. Right, so if we wanted to, uh, if we wanted to start by writing this out, so it's lithium hydroxide and nitric acid, and so lithium hydroxide, and lithium hydroxide is given to us as a solid. In this case, it says lithium hydroxide and it gives it um, mass. So you could write solid, although we're going to take it and dissolve it into the solution. So you could write solid or aqueous in this case, and, and both would be 
um, considered correct. So, but if you took solid so lithium hydroxide and reacted with nitric acid, which is nitrate with a hydrogen attached, and we'll go over the nomenclature for acids in a minute, and they're reacting together to make water and lithium nitrate. Right, and I'm just going to give myself more room here. Lithium hydroxide plus nitric acid makes water. We generally, since water is the solvent that our aqueous stuff is dissolved in, we don't write aqueous water because you don't really have water dissolved in itself. So we usually write water as a liquid in this case. Um, again, not something that I would be um, super picky on when it came to assigning partial credit for this. Uh, and then lithium nitrate. And nitrate and lithium are both are plus one and minus one respectively. And if we checked our solubility rules, we'd see that they're both still soluble. Um, if the if the problem did not state that, we could check it by doing that, by checking our solubility rules. <clears throat> so if we want to know what the X molarity of the excess reactant is, we just need to find out what runs out first. So we want to double check that it's balanced first. And like I mentioned, with a lot of these um, acid-base reactions are going to be one-to-one. -one. Their, their stoichiometry is going to be um, one to one in a lot of cases because it don't, you only need for every one hydroxide, you need one hydrogen ion to react with it to make water. So generally speaking, these are going to be one to one ratios, although it's always worth double checking. Uh, and that is the case here in this reaction. Uh, it is one to one, so it is already balanced. So then our question is, what the numbers again? It's excuse me. So we have a mass of lithium hydroxide, and we have a solution of nitric acid where we're given um, a volume and a concentration. So we have two different ways we're going to need to get to moles for these. So if we start from the um, lithium hydroxide, 3.25 grams of lithium hydroxide, And lithium hydroxide is going to be 6.941. Sorry, the, the molecular weight of lithium hydroxide is going to be the mass of lithium, which is 6.941, plus oxygen, which is 15.999, plus hydrogen, which is 1.008. Add all that up, we get 23.948. Grams is one mole. And based on the, the quizzes that I've seen so far, I think you guys were all getting more or less in the right direction. Some of you um, got hung up a little bit in the middle, but I think everybody's getting pretty good at, I can write the, the equation and I can convert things into moles, it seems like to me. Um, so we'll go through this so you guys can check your numbers on it and see if, if you messed up anywhere. But for the most part, I think you guys are getting pretty good at this. So I get 0 0.136 moles of lithium hydroxide. And if I wanted to turn a solution with a molarity into moles. We start with the volume, 
uh, so 125 milliliters. And remember that our concentration that we're given is in moles per liter. So if we're starting in 125.0 milliliters, we want to start by converting that to liters. So every thousand milliliters, that's one liter. And then we can use the concentration that's given, say, okay, for every one liter of the solution, that's 0 0.600 moles. And so 125 over 1,000 times 0 0.6, 0 0.75, sorry, 0, 0.0. 75 moles. So we wind up with a case where we can look at this and you can, once you realize it's all one to one, we can actually just look at this and tell what the limiting reagent is. Let me rewrite it just for the sake of clarity. We have 0.136 moles of lithium hydroxide and 0 0.075. And actually that should be with three sig figs. 0 0.0750 moles of the acid. All right, so because it's one-to-one, -one, we don't need to show the stoichiometry step but for the sake of, of being complete here, being crystal clear. We can say, um, we can write it out. We can say, okay, 0 0.0750 moles of nitric acid. And for every one mole of nitric acid, is one mole of lithium hydroxide used. So if we know how much lithium hydroxide we started with, and we know how much we're using, The moles of the excess is just going to be the difference between what you started with and what you used. So what we started with, 0 0.136 moles, and we used 0 0.0750. So we're going to get 0.136 minus 0 0.075, we get 0 0.061 moles lithium hydroxide left or excess. Right, so we're almost there. A number of you got here, wrote your answer, and stopped. Um, if you did, you were almost there. This is not the answer, though, because the question asked about, um, the question said, what is the concentration of the excess reactant? So you had to put it in molarity to get your final answer. So if you take this 0. Point and remember that with concentration, what we're looking for um, lit concentration lithium hydroxide is moles of lithium hydroxide, in this case, moles that are left over, divided by the volume of the solution in liters. 
So the volume in the solution, we take a solid and we add it to, a, to an aqueous solution, the volume of the aqueous solution doesn't change within sig figs. We can just say that it's the volume of the complete solution is still 125 milliliters. So all we need to do then, we want it in liters, but all we need to do is take our zero, 0 0.061 moles divided by 0 0.125 zero liters. And then when you do that, you get On the calculator, the answer is 0 0.488, but we only have two sig figs here. So our final answer should have been concentration of lithium hydroxide. And you did not have to write it as brackets like this. Equals 0 0.49, capital M for moles per liter, or you could write moles over liters. Right. So if you got all the way here, you were nine tenths of the way there. Just double check that you're answering the question that's actually was actually asked. It's not just moles, it was concentration. But you should still feel pretty good about where you got because you almost had it and you got almost all the points. That's two and a half out of the three points on this one. Um, so you did everything right up to the very end. It's a desk. Any, any questions about anything I did along the way here? Anything that was unclear? Um, I have a quick question. So if you are not given the 125 milliliters initially, then what would you plug in for volume of solution? Or would you have to be given? Yeah, some basically type you have to be given some sort of volume, yeah. Okay. And sometimes it would it might be written in a way like you mix these two solids together and then you add enough water to make the total volume 500 milliliters. But so it might not be as a solution, but there's gonna be some information in there somewhere that'll give you a volume. Um, and the only way that that gets trickier is if you mix two solutions together, your new total volume is the sum of what you mix together. If you had 125 mil milliliters of solution A and 100 milliliters of solution B, your final volume is both of those. It'd be the 125 plus the 100. Right? So I, again, it's one of those things that I always, I always say, well, it's kind of, you kind of have to think about it with common sense. And I know it's hard to visualize this stuff, especially since we didn't get as any time in lab this year. Um, but it's, if you think physically about what the reaction is describing, a lot of times it has that volume in it somewhere. You just have to, might have to stop and think. All right, anything else? As usual, we are just about right on schedule for our break. Now that we've done, I, I want to, <clears throat> there's a few more review things to go over. Uh, and actually, let me pull up the quiz where we talked about this. Um, so reminder about just the vocab that goes along with acid-base reactions. Whatever is accepting an H+, is going to be the base. So the sodium here, or sorry, the sodium, the um, nitrogen, ammonia, goes from NH3 to NH4 plus. It's gaining an H plus. That tells you it's the base. The water, on the other hand, is 
um, the water is losing an H plus. It is the, the H plus donor, the proton donor, which makes it the acid. Right, and so specifically, the, the most accurate way of describing that is, is that's the Bronsted-Lowry acid and the Bronsted-Lowry base. Um, most of the time, we can just refer to them as acid and base because that's the most common way of thinking about acids and bases is the Bronsted-Lowry definition. Um, but I'm not going to be super picky about that. Um, if we look at the, what happens when the reaction goes backward, that's how we can tell what the conjugate acid and the conjugate base is. Or you can, if you think about it, Zoom must have released some new update that's changing how their pointers work. It's kind of, it's not what I'm used to right now. Um, whatever the base turned into, becomes the conjugate acid. Because it's the same molecule with an extra H plus, which means if the reaction happened backwards, the molecule with the extra H plus would be the one that was giving away the acid. Or sorry, it was giving away the proton. Right, so for conjugate acid and conjugate base, it's talking about what happens if the reaction went backward is what I think is the, is the easiest way to think about it. If the reaction went backward, whatever, was, whatever the acid would be, in this case, if the reaction went backward, NH4 plus would be turning back into ammonia, back into NH3. The NH4 plus would be losing the H plus, which would make it an acid. And conversely, the hydroxide would be the conjugate base. So the ac over the course of the reaction, the acid turns into the conjugate base. The base turns into the conjugate acid. They sort of switch places because if the reaction happened backwards, the thing that had the extra H plus would now be the thing giving up the H plus. Which again, it's, it's a little bit like oxidizing agent and reducing agent. It takes a little bit of getting used to the way they use that language, um, but it's not that tricky of a concept once you're used to that. So for this reaction here, We've got hydrogen carbonate plus water turning into H2CO3, um, which is the carbonic acid and hydroxide. So we're looking here, the carbonate turning into carbonic acid, it's gaining an H plus. So that means that's your base. Whatever is accepting the H plus is your base. And that also tells us that this is going to be the conjugate acid. On the flip side, water is losing an H plus to become hydroxide. So that means the water is the acid. And that makes the hydroxide the conjugate base. Right, and it's not all that easy with all my chicken scratch all over to see the menus here. So the acid is going to be the water because the water is losing the proton and the base again the acid and the base are always going to be on the reactant side conjugate acid and conjugate base are always on the product side so if the acid is the water hydrogen carbonate is going to be the base 
And the conjugate acid is what you get when the base has the extra proton. So that would be the carbonic acid, H2CO3. And the conjugate base would be the hydroxide. And so I was, I was fairly pleased with how, how well um, most people did on the first part of this, but the conjugate acid and conjugate base part was still tripping people up. Um, so just remember that you're talking about conjugate acid and conjugate base, it's still the same logic, but you're talking about if the reaction went backwards. Give away the acid, except the base. Yes, you're at an, at an EDM music festival. And you're trying to stay away from drugs. Give away acid, except the base. That works. Um, that will at least stick in everybody's minds for a little bit. All right, let's, let's go ahead and take our break here. And then we'll do some practice with naming acids, and we will do some, some more practice with pH, which you got a little um, introduction to in lab last week. All right, so let's do 10 minutes. Let's come back at 235.
All right, folks. Let's do a little bit more conceptual stuff thinking about, about uh, acids and bases. Um, so based on our definitions, um, an acid can be anything that has an H plus that it can give up. Um, but there are certain classes of acids that are easy to identify and we actually name them using a different nomenclature. So, so far in this class, we've learned um, ionic nomenclature, which is when you have a positive ion and a negative ion, you just say the name of each of the ions, right? And then from the charges, you can figure out how many of each ion you have. Um, and we learned covalent nomenclature, molecular nomenclature, where we use the mono, di, tri, tetra, penta prefixes to indicate how much of everything we had. And that was anytime you had two non-metals making covalent bonds. If you have two non-metals bonded together, you use that covalent nomenclature. Um, acids are sort of in between. Acids are sort of like a, an ionic compound except they're very specifically, it's an ionic compound where the positive charge on the ionic compound comes entirely from hydrogens. So anytime you've got a, a negative ion and then enough hydrogens to make it neutral, we call that an acid. So for instance, if we had NaCl, we can look at that and say, okay, well, that's You've got a positive ion and a negative ion. So we're just going to say the name of each of them because it's an ionic compound. So we just call it sodium chloride. If instead of having the positive charge be a sodium, if you switch that for a hydrogen, an H plus ion, Every time I change color now, Zoom has decided that it wants, I should probably want it to be the thinnest possible pen, um, which is not the case. So if you use hydrogen as your plus and chloride as your minus, it would still be one to one, right? It would be HCl, but we don't really, and technically we would look at that according to our normal rules and we'd say, oh, well, HCl, those are two non-metals. So that, it must be a covalent bond. We're gonna name it as a covalent compound. However, if it's a hydrogen attached to something that you know normally has a negative charge, then we name it as an acid instead. Right? So it can be something like, if, and the most obvious ones to recognize are the polyatomic ions. So if you have phosphate, it's three minus, and then you have three H pluses, when you put that together, you get a formula that's H3. PO4, which looks a lot like a ionic compound, right? Except that instead of having a metal ion, you have a hydrogen ion. So that's what you're looking for. If it's an acid, it's going to be, it's going to look like an ionic compound, except your positive charge has to be hydrogens. Right? And so the, and the way we name these is actually based around the name of the um, of the ion, of the negative ion. Um, so let me clear this real quick. If the, if the ion, if the negative ion ends in ide, then when we name it as an acid, we turn that ide into ic. We put hydro in front. So ide turns into Hydro ic. So chloride turns into hydrochloric acid. Bromide turns to hydrobromic acid. So hydrobromic acid would be HBr. The name for that would be hydrobromic acid. HF would 
that negative charge there, that's a fluoride. So the cell ends in IDE. So we name that hydrofluoric acid. Um, iodide looks like you're spelling it wrong. Because in the English language, we don't like to put too many vowels next to each other when we can avoid it. But H, <coughs> H I would be hydroiodic acid. So anytime your negative charge ends in ide, I D E, this is the the way you name it. So the uh, there's one or two polyatomic ions that end in ide. For instance, cyanide. So cyanide is CN with a negative charge. So hy hydrogen cyanide, if we name it as an acid, that would be hydro cyanic acid. All right, so this can result in some names that sound a little bit off, but it's always down to if you know the name of the ions that make up um, the negative charge, it's always going to be the same patterns. If it ends in IDE, you do hydro ic. And there's a couple of, of goofy mnemonics to remember some of these that we'll go over at the end when we look at the others. If you, and probably the most common suffix for polyatomic ions was eight, nitrate, phosphate, sulfate, chlorate, anything that ends in eight, you just don't use the hydro part. Eight turns into to ick. So if you have a sulf or a nitrate, NO3 with a negative charge, if you put one H plus attached to that as your positive, you're balanced out and your charge is neutral. So HNO3 be nitric acid. Um, if it was carbonate, it's carbonate CO3 with a two minus charge. You have to have enough um, hydrogens to make it all the way neutral. Because if you add just a single, so this is carbonate, if you add a single hydrogen to it, a single H plus, you get HCO3 with a negative one charge. It's not neutral yet. You only balance out one of the two negative charges. Carbonate. Um, this is still a polyatomic ion, one that we just name as hydrogen carbonate. If we put two H pluses on the carbonate, now it's neutral. It becomes H2CO3. You've got two H pluses, and carbonate has a negative two charge, so the charge adds up to zero. And then we name it, since carbonate ends in eight, we drop the eight and we put ick. So it just turns into carbonic acid. Um, and I just saw your comment, Gina. Um, there are some amounts of hydrogen cyanide and hy hydrocyanic acid in um, apple seeds, um, which is interesting because hydrocyanic acid, when it's in its gas form, actually doesn't smell like apples or cherries. It actually smells like almonds. Um, so somebody asked, what's the strangest smell? to smell in, the, in a chemistry lab. Um, almonds is one of the most concerning because it can be benzaldehyde, which is synthetic almond extract, which is totally harmless. Um, or it could be hydrocyanic acid, in which case there's a non-zero chance you're about to die. Um, 
So that's uh, unexpectedly smelling almond in a lab is actually very concerning, usually. Um, you want to find out what that is very quickly and open some windows, um, just in case. Um, but yes, you, and you absolutely spelled it right too. And I believe, I don't know if it's hydrogen cyanide or if it's sodium cyanide, um, which is the, would be an ionic compound that uses cyanide as the, as the main part. Um, typically in small enough levels, though, you don't really need to be worried. If you accidentally eat some apple seeds, you're not about to die. Um, but you can take a whole bunch of apple seeds and crush them up and do an extraction and actually purify um, cyanide from that. Um, it's a fairly involved process, uh, but it is something that, that you could do. It's not something you worry about on an everyday basis, though, unless you smell almonds. Yeah, and, and cherries, it's a lot of seeds is where you're going to see a lot of that. Um, I don't know if that's a defense. I don't think it's a, an evolutionary defense event against the seeds being eaten. I think it's just a byproduct of some of the processes that the seeds need to kickstart some processes when they get planted. Um, because it's it's not present at large enough levels that you need to be worried about it, generally speaking. Um, unless you're eating every cherry pit you come across and you're eating a lot of cherries at the same time. Um, so good, good random chemistry application though. Um, some of these eights are a little bit um, irregular. For instance, um, so H2SO4. So SO4 to minus is sulfate. SO4, HSO4, one minus. That's a sulfate with one of the hydrogens canceling out a charge. So that would just be hydrogen sulfate. Um, if you have both of the hydrogens there, it's not just sulfic acid. It actually gets an extra syllable thrown back in there. Um, so it's actually sulfuric acid. Um, and a lot of them, a lot of these irregulars you've heard before. And so sulfic acid sounds weird, but sulfuric acid sounds probably, I, this is how I remember remembering these irregulars. It was not something that I remember having to sit down and memorize. Sulfuric acid just sounded more right because I'd heard that term before. Um, and if you wrote sulfic acid, I'm not going to really be that harsh on the, on the partial credit for that one because that is technically the way the rule says to do it. But um, it's better if you can remember to do that. And then the, the other irregular is phosphoric acid. H3PO4, when you have enough hydrogens to totally cancel out that charge, it's phosphoric acid. Whereas if you technically followed our rules, it would be phosphic acid. All right, there's only one other suffix that any of the polyatomic ions, any of the negatively charged ions ended in ide, ate, or ite. Everything ended in one of those three endings. So the only other way we need to remember how to name these acids is if it ends in ite, then you change the ending to O-U-S, us. So if you have H-N-O-3, that's nitrate. So that's nitric acid. But if you have H-N-O-2, that's nitrite. So that's nitrous acid. Right, so 
And again, the ites are far less common, generally speaking. So, so you are far more likely to, in especially in the in the real world, to run into um, an ate that is an ic acid. Um, but though ites do exist, and actually one of the ones that you do see this um, is it's not. Oh shoot, I'm blanking on it. It's not bleach because bleach is sodium hypochlorite. Um, might be a different, might be some brands of bleach um, where you have hypochlorous acid. So if you have, so hypochlorite is CLO with a negative one charge. So if you have enough hydrogens to counteract that, you have HClO, which the name of that would be hypochlorous. acid. So any of those polyatomics that had a prefix that modified them, like chlorate could be perchlorate, you just still leave that prefix there. So chlorate was um, the so chlorate is ClO3 with a negative charge. So chloric acid be HClO3, but then there was perchlorate, which was ClO4 with a negative charge. So if that's perchlorate, it still ends in eight. So we still follow our rules here. We just still have that per on the front of it as well. So instead of chloric acid, it's perchloric. acid, and that would be HClO4. Sean, um, yes. is, are these prefixes like, I mean, per is kind of with, that means with, for example, or do they, like per chloric acid, is that with chloric acid alongside kind of, or, sorry if it's a I tangent. Don't... <laughs> No, but, but you know, I like the etymology of this. I, I think it helps helps you remember when there are connections. I don't think that that's an actual etymology connection. Um, okay. Because per, so if, remember that when we talk, first started talking about polyatomic ions, there were all the family of chlorates that were all sort of based around the, the base molecule, the base ion was chlorate. And then per was was a modifier. Per chlorate mean, meant you took chlorate and you added an extra oxygen to it. And but it kept the same charge. And if you took chlorate and you removed an oxygen from it, it became chlorite. Um, and here's where it does get a little bit tricky that we can follow those rules for, for if we took another oxygen away, then it became hypo chloride. So I think if anything, the per and perchlorate might be related to hyper because hypo means without and hyper means with extra. So you can be hyperglycemic if you have too much blood sugar or hypoglycemic if you have too little blood sugar. So I would guess, if anything, that that's where the per comes from. But since right. it's really hard verbally to tell the difference between hyper and hypo, um, they probably just dropped the HY in front of the per. Wow. OK, thanks. But that's all, that's all pure speculation. Um, I do not know for sure that that is related at all. It just seems to make sense based on the fact that you've got the hypo at the bottom here. Yes. Okay, awesome, thank you. No problem. All right. Um, so with this in mind, this is one of the reasons why it's really advantageous to have that polyatomic ion list memorized so that you can look at a formula, not just for the ionic nomenclature, but also for this acid nomenclature, because 
nitrous acid is very different than nitric acid. And sulfuric acid is very different than sulfurous acid. So because these things behave very differently and they we name them differently as acids, it's all based around the suffixes here. Um, so there's a, and like I said, there's a couple ways that I had of um, remembering some of these. Um, there's a couple rhymes that I know students have used before. Um, the, the one that sticks out to me is my ride has hydraulics. And I'm going to butcher the spelling of hydraulics here, I think. There's a U in there, maybe. Um, but if, if you look at I'd as hydraulics, um, and then there's some that go, I ate something icky, and Sprite is delicious, are the ones I've seen students write on papers to on their tests to remind themselves. Um, the one, and this is, so this is really, really dumb, and hopefully it'll, that'll make it stick in your head the way it's stuck in my head for the last, geez, almost 20 years, um, is when I was in high school and I first learned this, I had a good friend whose name was Titus, um, which was sort of an unusual name and stuck in my head. And when I first learned this, it and us stuck in my head like my friend Titus's name. Um, so I just always remember it goes with us because it's like Titus. So I always think every time I teach this section of the class, I get to remember my friend from high school named Titus because, and now you will too. Every time you see this, you will remember my friend Titus. Um, and then, the, so that was sort of the irregular one. It with us, that was the one that doesn't really match the rest of them. So if you remember that, the and then the way that I remembered the this first one is the things that end in "-ied", tend to be the really simple ions, like chloride, bromide, iodide, even cyanide's a polyatomic, but it's still pretty simple compared to some of the others. The simplest ions get the most complicated name, which is always tricky and dangerous to memorize something as being backwards um, like that, but that always helped me with this one. If the simplest ions, I'd get the most complicated name. And then if you can remember my friend Titus as well, eight and ick are just the others that go together. There's only three possibilities, right? So um, there are lots of different ways to remember it. Like I said, that's not what I meant. Bring it back. Um, so my ride has hydraulics. I ate something icky. Sprite is delicious, probably more universal than my friend Titus, but I always still say it just because it might help stick in somebody's head. I ate something icky. And Sprite is delicious. Um, again, it's not foolproof. You could mix these up if you're not careful. But if you can recognize it as being an acid, it's always going to be based around what is the anion, what is the negative charge, um, is going to determine how you name it. I, I do also still remember my algebra two teacher in high school had a trick for remembering things about matrices. I mean, he took like half a class and he, he had polled everybody in the class and we voted on what our favorite our favorite soda was. Um, and we he had let us campaign for our favorite soda and convince try to convince each other. And then at the end, um, he wrote RC cola up on the board and RC is not was not even on our list and he said my my vote counts for 100 and I vote for RC cola um and that to this day is how I remember that when you are look at a matrix you, you read the coordinates rows then columns because 
took half of a class and did something really dumb like that. So these dumb little rhymes might also help you and remember them a long time from now, perhaps. All right. Um, sometimes you see them organized in slightly different ways. Um, some they call anything with it, oxygens, any polyatomics that have oxygens attached to them, they call them oxyacids. Um, I generally just think of them as being polyatomic ions. And so I don't typically group them like this, but this is just a list of common acids and their names. Um, and, but they all follow the same basic naming scheme. Um, the other one that sticks out as one that's a little bit different is acetate. Acetate was C2H3O2 with a negative one charge. When it's in its acidic form, you put an H on the front of it. So it's HC2H3O2. And that becomes acetic acid or vinegar. Um, everybody initially asks me, well, why don't you just put it the, the hydrogen in the front with the other hydrogens? Why don't you just write it C2H4O2? And the answer is because we're trying to make it really, really explicitly clear that this is a polyatomic ion and that's an acidic proton. That's a, an H plus that you can lose. Acetate can't lose all four or all, all the other hydrogens. The other three hydrogens are not acidic. They won't come off of that molecule. So we keep the acidic hydrogen separate from the other hydrogens just for the sake of making it very, very explicitly clear. Here is acetate and here's a proton. Um, it wouldn't technically be wrong to write C2H4O2, but there's a number of different compounds that that could be. And so to avoid confusing the situation, they could write it as acetate with an H plus attached to it. Um, and actually that ties into um, Vesper geometries, molecular geometries again as well, because this molecule, when you have acetic acid, it's actually the fact that you've got two carbons, they're very different carbons from each other. If you look at the Lewis dot structure for acetic acid, you actually have two very different carbons. You have one of your carbons is a tetrahedral geometry. It's sp3 um, hybridization, but and it's got four electron groups around it, no double bonds. The other carbon has a double bond, which makes it trigonal planar, and it's got all these oxygens around it too. So the fact that we have different hydrogens means they're not all going to be equally acidic. They're not all equally easy to pull off. And so that's why we write the other hydrogen separately and why sometimes there's actually a different way of writing acetate in general, where instead of writing it C2H3O2, a slightly more accurate way of writing it is actually CH3CO2 minus, because that actually differentiates between the two carbons and shows you what's happening a little bit. Um, but this is getting into how we draw things in, in organic chemistry versus um, intro to chemistry. So I won't get into that too much, but that is still acetate. And this is exactly why we usually do not combine our acidic proton with the other hydrogens. We keep it drawn separately so we can see what we're dealing with. All right, I don't think there were any others in here that are that, that are tricky or anything unique about them necessarily. Um, other than, we'll come back to that one in a second. Um, we talked about strong versus weak acids, or we talked about strong electrolytes versus weak electrolytes. 
said strong electrolytes meant when you dissolve them in water, they turn into their ions 100% of the time. So for instance, sodium chloride turning into sodium ions and chloride ions. And the fact that that happens pretty much 100% of the time when you dissolve sodium chloride in water, 100% of the ions split up in the water, or at least close to it. And so that, that made it a strong electrolyte. We do the same thing with acids. Any acid that gives up its H plus 100% of the time when you put it in water, we call that a strong acid. So when you put hydrogen chloride, hydrogen chloride, when it's pure, it, um, is, uh, is a gas. Um, and so we actually don't name it as hydrogen chloride when it's, or uh, hydrochloric acid when it's a gas. When you dissolve it in water, it splits up into, and technically this is if it reacts with water. So it turns into H3O plus and chloride, and it does it 100% of the time. So the fact that it does it 100% of the time makes it a strong acid. Relative to water, if you put HCl in water, 100% of the time within sig figs, that hydrochloric acid will give away its proton. That's what makes it a strong acid. Um, and so somebody asked the question on the quiz that said, can you classify acids as strong or weak based on their formulas alone? The answer is, is yes, but maybe not in the way that you want me to say yes. Um, it basically, there's only six strong acids and you kind of just memorize them. Um, they're the ones that show up the most um, as acids. Um, so, and they are um, three of the binary acids, three of the simple acids. So HCl, HBr, HI are strong acids. Then the other three are polyatomics, and they're some of the most common ones. It's nitric acid, sulfuric acid, and perchloric acid. These are at least the most common strong acids. There are other strong acids out there that are just far less common. For instance, if you had perbromate, it would probably perbromic acid is probably a strong acid, but that's a really uncommon polyatomic ion to have. It'd be very reactive. So we don't typically consider that in our list of um, strong acids. Um, but basically, if it's one of these four, it's a strong, or sorry, one of these six, I can count, I promise, um, then it's a strong acid. And if it's not one of these six, it's a weak acid. And we just draw the line right there. Um, and that that means you don't need to necessarily think too hard about it. Six is not that strong, um, that hard of a list to memorize, especially since these are also the most common acids that you're used to hearing about, with the exception of maybe acetic acid. Hydrochloric, nitric, and sulfuric are the ones we use. If we are using an acid in a lab, nine times out of 10, it's gonna be hydrochloric, nitric, or sulfuric acid. Um, if we wanted, if you want practice naming acids, here's some practice, and I, we've already talked about most of these, but again, find the polyatomic ion, and then use the right, the right suffix. So if you start by just looking at this, that's perchlorate. That means that the acid is going to be perchloric acid, eight something icky. There's bromide. So, most the simplest acids, the most complicated name, or my ride has hydraulics, so hydrobromic. <laughs> 
right? It takes practice. And especially if you don't have your polyatomic ions memorized yet, um, then you're going to need that list of polyatomic ions to do this. Um, so make sure you have that saved and or handy when you're doing this, because it's always just a matter of find it on your polyatomic ion list, or if it's a simple one, then it's going to end in I'd. Um, and then you're using those three suffixes to name them. And that also means that we have, um, you know, that I can just like on the quiz, you can, I can describe things using acid nomenclature now. And say, if I say carbonic acid, I expect that you can take, okay, carbonic acid, that means it's carbonate with hydrogens to make it neutral and get to H2CO3 from there. Right, again, you might need to double check what carbonate is, what the formula is, what the charge is, but it's we're just adding another another layer of nomenclature here, which I get is still confusing, but hopefully it's not confusing in the it's hard to follow the concepts way. It's just confusing in the there's just one more thing to remember way. Any questions on the nomenclature here? Um, all right, so last thing that, that we'll go over today is, is just the, um, is where pH comes from. So we talked a little bit about pH and what the definition of pH is. Um, but for whatever reason, we're used to thinking about pH as basically going from 0 to 14. And that's not strictly speaking accurate. But we can talk about where that comes from real quick. And it basically, the pH scale in general comes from this reaction right here. And it's not a reaction, it's not a strong reaction that happens 100% to, to completion. This is what's called an equilibrium reaction, which means it's going to happen forward at the same rate as backward when you get to certain concentrations. Um, and this equilibrium reaction is also called the, it's called the auto-ionization of water. And so auto ionization is exactly what it sounds like. Ionization means making something an ion. The auto ionization of water means water turning itself into ions. Um, and so this is a reaction that happens if you have pure water, this reaction is happening constantly. If you have pure water, it's not, it turns out all, um, every molecule of it is not H2O. Turns out that if you have pure water, there's a certain percentage of the water molecules that will go through this auto ionization reaction and make hydronium and hydroxide. You basically have, if you have all these water molecules, if they bump into each other just right, you can wind up with one water molecule acting as an acid, the other water molecule acting as a base. And you wind up turning the two water molecules, two H2Os, into H3O plus and hydroxide. So what this means is that even at, if you have totally pure neutral water, you still have some of these two compounds that we usually think of as defining something as being acidic or basic. And it turns out that we can actually predict this mathematically for some of these equilibrium reactions. And you guys aren't going to have to do this math, but I'm just showing you where this comes from. Um, at equilibrium, if you have pure water, you're going to have equal amounts of hydroxide and H3O+. And those amounts, those concentrations, will always multiply together to give you a constant that we call Kw. So 
if you have water, this relationship always holds up. The concentration of hydroxide in a solution times the concentration of H plus or the concentration of hydronium is always going to multiply to get together to give you this 10 to the minus 14 number. So why does that matter? That seems, okay, cool. I know that now. Good for me. Um, why does this apply? Was well, because this compound right here, the extra protons, is what we use to define something as being acidic. If there are extra H pluses around, that makes it an acidic solution. And so since we're dealing with concentrations that are so small here, if we actually solved, if we said that, okay, well, hydroxide, if you're in pure water, the only source of hydroxide and hydronium is, is this auto-ionization reaction, then these two concentrations should be equal to each other, right? So you could actually solve this. You can plug in X for both of these. And solve for a concentration of each of them in pure water. And it winds up being a really, really small number. In pure water, you wind up solving for a concentration of H3O plus is equal to 10 to the minus 7 moles per liter. And same with the concentration of hydroxide in pure water. Well, those are really, really, really small concentrations. So they decided to use a log scale to actually measure these. And so this is where the pH scale comes from and why a pH of 7 is considered neutral. If it's a pH of 7, then that means that, that in water, you're going to have equal amounts of these two compounds. So you have, you're balanced out between your H3O plus and your hydroxide. If you add extra hydroxide, your, your H3O plus concentration drops. If you add extra acid, your H3O plus concentration goes up and your hydroxide drops. And so you wind up with this balancing act where as you add H3O plus, hydroxide changes and vice versa. Right? And so this is where um, pH came from originally. And it also, why we have another term we call POH. So pH was negative log. So Remember from last week's lab, we said that P, lowercase p, just means take the negative log of something. So pH is the negative log of H3O plus concentration. POH is the negative log of hydroxide concentration. And if you take the negative log of this expression right here, and do some law of logs and rearrange things, you actually get this expression down here. pH plus pOH equals 14. So it, this is also useful because it allows us, if you know pH and the concentration of H3O plus, you also know concentration of hydroxide, which winds up being useful down the road when we start talking about things like buffers. Um, so we are about out of time, but it essentially means that if you look at this box at the bottom, if you know any one piece of that box, you know the rest of them too. Because if you know concentration of H3O plus, you can calculate pH. And if you can calculate pH, you can calculate pOH. And if you can calculate pOH, you can calculate hydroxide. Right? So this allows us to figure out, you don't need to know your concentration of H3O plus to get to pH. Sometimes you're going to have excess hydroxide when you do an acid base reaction. And if we want to know the pH of that solution, we need to start by figuring out 
concentration of hydroxide. And then we can work backwards to get to pH from there. So what this allows us is in either an acidic solution or a basic solution, we can still figure out the pH by using this equation. All right, and so we will practice, we will, uh, in lab, we will work through this. I'll record it and post it separately when lab's done today. Um, so we get some practice with pH as well. Um, and we will keep working on acids and bases as well too, and talk about limiting reactant and excess reactant. Because it turns out, if you look at this reaction, These two things, you have a hydroxide and you have a strong acid. Whatever is left over, whatever the, is the excess reactant is going to control the pH. If you have hydroxide left over, it's gonna be basic because you're gonna have extra hydroxide, extra OH minus. If you have excess acid, it's gonna be an acidic pH because you, you're gonna have excess H3O plus around. So knowing how to do an excess, this is basically just an excess reactant problem where you throw a pH on the end of it, right? So mathematically, it's not that different than what we've been working on, and we'll just keep practicing with it. All right. Only two minutes over this time. Um, we'd still start lab a few minutes uh, late to give everybody a chance to get some water, take a break. Um, so let's start lab at 335, and we'll work through this problem, do some practice with pH. And again, it'll be recorded. All right, see everyone there or later. Bye, Mr. Ryland. Thank you.